So in our previous video on the foundations of slavery in colonial America, we looked at more of the economic side of things. In this particular video, we seek to understand or at least explore why it became common, as you can see at the top, and also how society was altered by slavery. When it comes to coerced labor or forced labor, if you remember back to when we looked at Jamestown, there was this preference for indentured servants, individuals who either the company or a private individual would pay for their passage. Usually you work for four to seven years, usually seven years, you pay off your debt, pay off your voyage, and you're free. Well, we're talking back-breaking labor here. And fewer and fewer Europeans are willing to subject themselves to seven years of hard labor. So chattel slavery becomes more viable. Chattel slavery, as in you are enslaved, your children are enslaved, and so on. Now, Native Americans were enslaved. That was one of the first things Europeans tried, but they were more likely to escape. They understood the land and the terrain, they could survive, they would run away. White indentured servants, if they ran away, could more easily disappear into colonial societies due to their skin color. So it's not as if race is the factor, but it is certainly a factor. Make no mistake, racism does develop, but not necessarily at first. Now, when you see the dollar signs here, the end of the 1600s, a lifelong slave would cost someone 25 to 30 pounds, pounds being the money system in England. An indentured servant of four to seven years cost 15 pounds. So it seemed to be more of the economic option. Fewer indentured servants also means that there are going to be fewer freedmen who are likely to rebel against a growing landed elite. So indentured servants will fall out of favor. The other question arises, why did West Africa become the region that was forced to provide this labor source? Now when it says trading system in place, it was common for African tribes who were at war with each other, different tribes, different kingdoms, to keep prisoners of war as slaves. And they would often sell them to Arab traders who would transport them in these large camel caravans across the Sahara Desert. So there was a system in place. It's just that instead of going east, maybe to the Mediterranean or north across the Sahara, they would now go west. Now this notion of division. Slaves are transported with Africans from a different tribe or kingdom, so there was no common language, no common customs. And since these kingdoms are pitted against each other for economic gain, there was incentive to compete and capture those from rival kingdoms. What we see happening is that the white European traders were not the ones doing the capturing. They would contract with rival African kingdoms and these Africans would capture individuals from different tribes or kingdoms. As to why that was, well, big reason right here. Initially, the Portuguese tried going into the interior, but malaria wiped them out. So they would get other tribes to do the work for them. Now, inherited resistance to malaria, that disease we've seen infect settlers and cause death ever since Jamestown, this resistance is most prevalent in West and Central African societies. And those who live there, I mean, there's kind of two main types of malaria. Those from these areas demonstrate a 97% immunity to one type of malaria and are very resistant to another strand. Repeated childhood exposure 
means that they're more likely to survive the disease in the South and they can continue working. So the fact that they were resistant to malaria and weren't getting wiped out like other parts of the workforce contributed to why it was more desirable to have Africans working in tropical climates. And finally, from the beginning, religious discrimination. Yes, the discrimination became racially based, but initially it was based on religion, or that was a big part of it. West African societies were not Christian. You know, plain and simple, that they weren't practicing Christians. So they were seen by Europeans as uncivilized. So justifying the practice of humans owning other humans, well, to do this, many looked towards Christianity. Many did use the Bible to justify it. So these factors combined to explain why West Africa was the labor force. Now, obviously, this is a, an enormous question. How was society altered? But if we look for a couple of answers, yes, there, there were slaves in the North. There were Northern colonies that permitted slavery. And there were slave owners in the North. Now, for example, Benjamin Franklin owned several slaves during his lifetime. But eventually, he became an abolitionist and argued against it on economic grounds. You see, in the South, there's very large rice and tobacco plantations. There's not many opportunities to earn a living. And these plantations require large labor forces. In the North, there's a lot of economic opportunities. Yes, there's farming, but there's also trade, commerce, shipbuilding, whaling, you know, ranching, whatever the case may be, there are plenty of ways to earn a living that don't involve coerced labor. And the northern colonies that did allow it will phase it out over time. Now, for early opportunities, there were some masters who did treat their slaves more like indentured servants, and they would free them. And there were other masters that allowed their slaves to acquire property, acquire livestock. The slaves would sell these items and it would allow them to buy their freedom and they could purchase the tools required to become free planters. So despite the intense physical labor, despite the system where men claim to own other men, there were opportunities for freedom. Now, in the late 1600s, this all changes. Africans are growing in pretty large numbers. And anytime you have the movement of a group of people from one place to another, see, West Africa isn't always what immediately comes to mind when you talk about colonial immigration. But you want to talk about a large segment of society that migrated, even though it was against their will, definitely West Africa. And when you have a movement like that, you are going to see a transplant of different customs and cultures. This alarms slave masters. And they fear that the increased numbers of African slaves are going to band together to try and earn their freedom. Now, these slave codes, as they were passed in different places, I mean, you know, they vary from place to place. However, there are a few consistencies. These codes are designed to restrict the movement of slaves and limit their chances to acquire property. I mean, you can see here, slaves are considered property. And they were considered property up until the year 1865. Up until the year 1865 in the United States. So, free assembly. Slaves were not allowed to gather in groups of over four. The militia controlled, uh, pat patrolled the countryside, yeah, patrolled it and controlled it. And they would demand to see the papers of anyone who was black. 
because there could be a free African-American, there could be a slave, you had to carry a paper to signify your status. So the militia would demand to see papers. Owning a firearm was illegal. The days became longer and the work week became six days. Sometimes your master might make you work on Sunday. Now it was impossible to add more years onto the service of a slave. Like if an indentured servant stepped out of line, you could just tack on more years. That keeps him in line. A slave is a slave for life. So the only punishments, we have pain and fear. Misbehavior is punished with whipping and torture. And truthfully, I mean, the things you've heard about it, true. Nasty, brutal system. If a slave died because their master excessively punished them, they wouldn't be charged with anything. No repercussions. Now, economically, poor white Southerners should have combined with slaves to protest these inequalities. But laws were passed to encourage a racial divide. With these slave codes, here's where race clearly enters the equation. Virginia actually passed a law which meant that any slave who hit or threatened a white man would get 30 lashes. There was also a law that confiscated slave property to benefit poor, right, uh, poor whites. Interracial marriage was illegal, both for the ministers who performed the ceremonies and the participants. White people, black people, they're pitted against each other due to these laws. Now keep in mind, Slaves understood full well what was going on. The big fear, the reason for these slave codes, was the fear of revolt. Probably the most famous one of the colonial era was the Stono Rebellion, which broke out 20 miles from Charlestown, South Carolina, September of 1739. It began when 20 slaves killed the owners of a store, and they seized guns and ammunition. They marched south, beating drums and chanting liberty, trying to not only increase their numbers, but increase the number of slaves who could try and achieve freedom. There were seven plantations burned, and 20 whites were killed in the process. Now about 100 members of the white militia surrounded and killed most of the participants. 30 of them made it into the woods, and they were killed within a month. I mean, we can see here, on this marker, what the goal was. Doesn't say that the end result was nearly all of the slave participants were killed. You know, Spanish Florida welcomed runaway slaves, so they would have been free. This leads to fears that it could happen again and much worse. Those who suffered were the ones who didn't participate because the slave codes became that much harsher. Anytime slavery is present in a society, there is a fear of a successful revolt like the Stono Rebellion, and this Stono Rebellion will be used to justify harsh treatment of slaves from this moment on. But this rebellion, this large-scale rebellion, was the exception, not the rule.